in our Craving Answers, Craving God podcast, we have addressed what we think is an epidemic problem in our American culture. That problem is human isolation, depression, and even suicide. It is true that men, particularly young men, are in this category. How serious is this problem? Why is it happening? How did we get to this point? And most importantly, is there anything we can do to reverse the trend and help those who are suffering? Let's talk about it today on Craving Answers, Craving God. I'm Chuck Rathard with Aaron Miller. Aaron is the pastor of St. James Lutheran Church in Glen Carbon, Illinois. Aaron, let's do a little review. On past programs, you have referred to the current wave of depression in our society as epidemic. Can you describe the magnitude of the situation for us? Um, probably not at great length. It, it, just what I've said before, I, people are incredibly lonely now. People are incredibly anxious. Uh, depression is it's, it's widespread. The, incredibly. The, the use of... Um, meds to combat depression and anxiety is uh, um, through the roof. And uh, I'm not saying, I, I always have to say this for our listeners who are taking meds, that uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't. What I'm talking about is how way more people are now than have been in the past. And there are lots of reasons for this. And I, I didn't make these up. Sociologists have studied this and uh, a lot of it is the isolation. We've convinced ourselves that individualism is the most important value, individual freedom. Uh, because of that, we live for ourselves, even if we're not intentionally thinking we are. Uh, that creates a scenario where others are incidental to us instead of our primary uh, reason for being. And um, that creates high levels of loneliness. Trying to live for myself to make myself happy is the quickest way to not be happy because that is going to make me lonely. Um, th there are other reasons too. Uh, um, the internet's a big one, actually. Uh, it used to be, we're all dissatisfied now. It used to be a uh, hundred years ago, even 50 years ago, you, you grew up in a town and you knew you were going to marry somebody from that town. And th there's only so many people of marriageable age in that town and you found one and you and the other person, you liked each other and it worked out and you were a good match. Your families were good matches. Your um, ideologies and your goals for your future were good matches. And so you married, but now uh, you can jump on Instagram and see a bazillion people of marriageable age. And what it does is it stirs up in us this. It's not just that you can, it's not, the options are so massive that the standards now have become, I've got to find the right one in there. There, there could be somebody better. Like, it, it, you know, in my town growing up, if there's, let's say that there's a, a hundred girls who I could marry in that town, there's a hundred girls. But if there's a million girls, then the girl I choose might not be the exact right girl. It's the same way with a lot of things. It's the same way with buying houses. Used to be you'd move into a town, you'd talk to your realtor. There's four or five houses. You'd look around, you'd find one, you'd say, oh, this one's good. And now people, uh, you know, I'm not going to blame Zillow for this. Zillow is more of a symptom than it is the uh, the cause. People are, they have to find the exact right house. Well, once you start living your life where you have to have the exact right partner, the exact right car, the exact right house, the exact right clothes, the exact right meal, you are constantly going to be dissatisfied because there's always the possibility that you missed one. There's always the possibility that you didn't see the exact right girl. There's always the possibility that the perfect home went for, went on sale and popped up on Zillow two days after you signed the papers on the home you bought, and that drives us that drives us crazy. It drives it's it's uh, very anxiety inducing, very frustrating. So there's lots of different reasons for this. Um, another reason, and I, we're going to talk about this today. I know is um, traditional gender roles which have reflected the way humans are designed have been upended. I'm not here to complain. This is going to, I'm not here to, to complain about, you know, 
uh, we should keep women out of STEM industry. I, I'm not interested in that at all. Uh, you, you know, I'm all for women being empowered and for working. So just I'll start off right off the bat by saying this is not complaining about um, women being successful. I'm, I'm very, very happy for women who are successful in career ways. My main concern is, and I know this is where we're headed today, Chuck, is um, with young men who uh, their biology – their traditional, what they're bent for, sociologically, biologically, what they're designed for, uh, they've been told you can't do that anymore. You shouldn't be that way anymore, and that creates a lot of a lot of male depression revolves around not having any sort of sense of purpose because what they're made for, they're not allowed to be anymore. So, there's somebody listening to us who is saying, "Yeah, you know, I I I hear what you're saying." I've seen some of that myself. I know what you're talking about. But epidemic, that sounds to me to be, that our person may just say, a gross exaggeration of the problem. But you've been pretty consistent. You've been pretty firm using that term, epidemic problem. So what do you know that we don't know? I don't think I know anything that other people don't know. I, I mean, people are good at hiding it. There's a game that we play where performanceism where I can't act like I'm struggling and you can't act like you're struggling. This is a part of what it means to be an individualist is that I have to put on a face of success. That's individualism. The, what we believe in our culture is that the individual is the highest authority, the most worthy, uh, the happiness of, of whom is the most worthy pursuit. If I'm not achieving that, I'm a massive failure. If I'm struggling with anxiety and depression, that means I'm a massive failure. Uh, so we hide it really well. Um, uh, you know, if people say, I don't believe it. I don't, I don't believe that there's all the mental health issues that people talk about. I would just say, you know, you're hiding it from yourself. People are hiding it from you. If you really got to know people and started to talk to them about their lives, you would see that it, it's actually it's actually quite rampant. I personally know of some parents who have told me, not a, not a lot, but some, that they have a son who doesn't come out of the basement. And when they say that, they mean it pretty much literally. They say that he spends all of his time playing video games. They say he doesn't really have any friends. He has little regard for school expectations or social activities. I think you've described how this happened. Can you put a bullseye on it for me? How did it happen that we went from those kind of small towns where you went to the same high school, you married your high school sweetheart, to boys who are completely isolated in the basement and their parents can't get him out. Yeah. This isn't even a, a small town versus big town thing. This is the case in cities that um, traditionally men who, whether you lived on a farm or whether you lived in the middle of the city, it was expected that, and, and, and the reason why this tradition is there is because it matches up with men's biological and psychological makeup it was expected that you were going to grow up and your main goal in life was going to be to provide and protect for the people within your sphere and that you were going to sacrifice to make that happen. You were going to work hard and that you're, you weren't going to live for pleasure. And I'm still of the age, my, my, my father grew up in this culture and it was just normal. My father didn't think at all when he was growing up, like, what fulfills me? He just thought, like, I, I need to do something. I was talking to somebody the other day whose uh, you know, father grew up w working in the steel mill in a town close to where we're sitting now. And didn't one time think, oh, this, is, this, doesn't, this doesn't light my passions up. This doesn't, this doesn't excite me emotionally. He just thought, I need to provide. I, I, need, to, I need to sacrifice myself. For the good of my family. And, and I'll come home at night and I'll have a beer and I'll read the newspaper and watch the news and fall asleep in the chair. And uh, I'll go fishing on the weekend. Oh, we'll go vacation once a year. Oh, it's, I'm not going to not have any fun or relax at all. But my main goal in life is to provide for this wife and these kids and to make sure that they're protected and well taken care of. And so, man, this, fit, this fits in with the way that God designed men biologically and psychologically is that we were programmed to be like this. And so the kind of physical activity that that takes to be, the, to be a provider, to be a self-sacrificial giver, is now seen as aggressive. 
um, the type of, you, you know, to work hard is now seen as a sign of um, too much energy. To, to, you, you know, your, your masculinity is too strong. You need to back off a little bit. And so what happens is um, guys are told growing up, you know, that's don't be like that. Be gentle, be meek. And there's a sense, there's a sense in which guys should be gentle and meek, but what they're not doing now is they're not really making efforts to work hard because it it is seen as, um, you know, your aggression is, is toxic. They're not really making an effort to think about it's my job to provide for people because that's overstepping your boundaries. Who are you to say that say that you should provide for people? So what they do is they play video games where they can be aggressive and in that video game, whether it's a sports game or a first-person shooter war game, they can do what their biology demands, and it turns them on. And that's depressing for them because they know it's fake. It's not real. They have to turn that off eventually and go back to So you'll, you'll hear about guys who will play video games nonstop, 24 hours, 48 hours straight, They'll lose their jobs. They'll, they won't come up out of the basement. And that's because the fake world that they're living in is more fulfilling than the real world. And part of that's the culture telling them, don't be the way you're designed to be. Part of it is them giving in and thinking, well, I have to go along with the culture too. So I'm, th- I'm thinking as I listen to you to describe this, you describe the male, the son who grows up to become an adult, marries, has children, does all those things that you just described, raising children, uh, providing, taking care of business. We've devolved from that sort of very responsible masculine role type into a boy who is sitting in the basement and we can't get him out of the basement. So are the influences that caused that shift, that caused that change, change mostly external? We changed around the boy, and that changed the boy? Because that's kind of what I heard you say. I think it's a both and. I, you, you know, I men, like women, want to be accepted, want to know that they're fitting in the society's expectations for them. And when that shifts, their expectations about themselves shift, even if it goes against the grain of how they're made. So I don't know, you know, the chicken or the egg, I'm not sure. My suspicion is, is that you're right, is that society changes first. And, but I I will say this. Have we pushed these kids into the basement? Basically, and I know there are exceptions. There are always exceptions. Yeah. But if we push these boys into the basement? I I think so. I think to a large degree, the culture has been complicit in stifling young manhood. I mean, there's, there's other, I mean, there's a million factors here. This is, I, I'm not even qualified to talk extensively about this. And even if I was a half hour is not long enough to do it, but the lack of the, the lack of, you know, if you look at the percentage of families where there's no father, where a boy grows up in a home and there's no father present, it's quite high. If you look at the classrooms in our country, the, the absence of male teachers or male role models in the school it's quite high. Why do we need a male role model? Why you said something which I think might be controversial. I wish I could quote you exactly here and I can't remember how you put it, but you said males, men are programmed by God to be male, to be masculine. It's not something that we choose to do. You know, you find out somewhere along the way, hey, I guess I guess I'm a boy. So I guess I'll do these things. But you said that this is the way God made men. So there's, there's something at larger here going on than just culture and just society. If God is involved and we fail so that our boys are locked up in the basement, then we've not only offended him, the boy, but we've offended God. Is that what I hear you saying? I'm less interested in that. I think that's true, but, 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 I mean, the, the payout is is that if you don't, if we don't live lives the way that God has designed us to live them, we're not. It's not going to work. It's going to be broken. Uh, you know, God's not. It's not so much that God is sitting around being, like, "I'm offended that you won't act like I want you to," as it is that He says, 
This is what I've programmed you to be. You should go be that. And if you don't, you're going to be broken. And there's going to be all kinds of symptoms of being broken, like mental health issues, physical health issues too. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, we are complicit. I mean, you, you, you started off the question asking your first question right there, Chuck, was why do we need male role models? And the answer is, is because God designed all of us. He designed us as men or women. And he designed us to live in a community with other men and women. And the way how the, the way I learned to be a man, there's two factors that go into me learning to be a man. This is broadly speaking. One is, is I need a man or other men in my life, which God thankfully gave me, a father and a really excellent, wonderful grandfather, to model for me what it means to be self-sacrificial, to be hardworking, to be someone who lives their life for others. To be someone who does not boss around his wife or use her as some sort of appliance, but actually exist to serve and love her. My father and my grandfather both did that. But I also need women in my life to teach me and train me what it's like to be a man loving and serving other women. To be a man who respects women, who lets them talk and takes them seriously. If I grow up in a context with no women just aggressive man, I'm going to end up being an animal. But if I grow up in a context with no men, just women, I'm going to be shaped and formed in the image of just one part of what it means to be human in, in, in a feminine sort of way. And this is another element to it that this as well is that, well, here's a couple factors and I, I, I'm going to try and stay on track here because there's, uh, I'm going to go back one or two steps and hopefully not lose my train here. The sexual revolution trained men to live for themselves, that women exist for their sexual pleasure. Men have done their dangdest to train women to participate in this. As a result, women have learned to disdain men and their aggressiveness as tools of manipulation. Men need to repent of this and abandon the project of the sexual revolution and say, I'm not going to treat women as sexual objects anymore. I'm going to love and serve the females in my life. Right. Now, the side effect of this is that women have risen up, we call this feminism, and said, men are pigs, men should be more like us. And because women tend to be, and I, again, there's, there's, uh, there's obviously uh, uh, outliers and I'm not saying that all women are like this, I, and I'm not using this as a pejorative. Don't, I'm, I'm not like a 1950s comedian. Women tend to be geared towards more emotional intelligence. Men have been trained, stop thinking, stop doing, and you need to get more in touch with your feelings. You need to be more sensitive. Even the Christian church has participated in this. Men have abandoned the Christian church um, because a, a lot of times the Christian church is geared towards your feelings, the music that we play is more emotive and less strong and less solid in theological beliefs, solid in here's what we as Christians need to do and more about how we feel. Christian sermons tend to be more, how, more about how we feel. And, and by doing that, we're training these men to be more like women when men need to be more like men, but men who respect women. That's what they need to be. And so the question, why do I need a male role model in my life is just this. If I don't have a male role model in my life, I'm not learning how to be that man. I'm being trained how to be like a woman, which is going to be inherently, it's going to be frustrating, anxiety inducing. It's going to be depressing to me. So you and your wife, Angela, have three children. Your oldest is your only son of the three, and he is about to leave home. Uh, thus begins the empty nest, the coming empty nest for the Miller family, and begin his first year in college. So he is completing now the transition from adolescence to adulthood. As his father, what has life been like for you? And have you helped him with that transition? I'm sure you want to help. Were you successful or is the jury still out? There's no, uh, there's no, I mean, we're all works in progress. There's no success or failure. It's day to day, every moment, bad decisions, good decisions. Like if you ask my father, were you successful with Aaron? He would say yes, because he's a nice guy. But honestly, I grapple with all this stuff to, to, to this day. I'm not, you know, I'm not standing on some podium as like, well, I've achieved it, you know, um, I don't know. It's it's definitely a work in progress, and it's a push against the culture. 
which I, you know, I can tell Harry, it's, you know, it's good to be a man. It's good to work hard. It's good to be aggressive. If that aggression is used to love and serve others, it's good to have a goal to provide for the woman that you're in love with, the woman that you're someday going to marry. But the culture is telling him, Hey, well, back off, back off. And the, the culture is telling him a lot of things like that. Like, you know, a, you, you shouldn't, your goal should not be to provide for a woman that's offensive. Your goal should be to live for yourself. That's, that's the main thing, you know, and what I've been doing with Harry is, you know, we're, we're working through this transition of, um, he goes to the refrigerator and he opens it up looking for something to take out something to eat or something to drink. And we've been working on this transition of now going to the refrigerator and opening it up and thinking, what do I need to put in there? What's missing that I should go to the store and buy and put in there? Stop thinking as a taker and start thinking more as a provider and as a giver, which all of us need to do eventually. But if, if we're not, you know, if all we are is individualist, then we're going to be takers and takers are never, never, we're programmed. It's, it's more blessed to give than to receive. As long as God has programmed us to be providers and givers, but we insist on living lives where we're takers, we are going to be depressed. And so trying to help him see this is the path to mental health. It's not, you could struggle with other stuff. There's other factors involved here. But one thing is for certain, if he's selfish, he will be depressed. If he's a giver, it's going to mitigate against that temptation, to, 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 uh, not temptation, but the tendency towards depression. So you have done some teaching at the local community college. So you're around college kids, young adults. Uh, you've done some teaching at the local Lutheran high school you're probably more exposed to that group of people than most of the rest of us. You cross paths with a lot of young people. And I would think that would put you in a position to know maybe more than the rest of us on average, what these challenges are, how it is that masculinity has fallen out of favor in our culture. And now here you have a young man that you're bringing into adulthood. I would think that you would be as well positioned to address that as he goes from 12 to 20 as anybody. I, I'm assuming that you got active in that phase and did certain things to try to affect a positive outcome. Do you have advice for the person who's listening to us who's got a, a boy in the basement or some a boy, maybe he's not in the basement, but he's isolated and he needs help. Do you have advice for that parent or that dad? Well, I would first of all, I'd say you, you have to address the cultural and ideological reasons behind why your son is staying in the basement. This notion that well, they're just lazy. This is not true. Laziness is a symptom. You, you, most people are not lazy about something they're passionate about. You know, he's not. You know what he's not lazy about is conquering that next level on that video game. He'll work like crazy on that. And, you know, like, of course, the boomers are all like, who cares about that? That's just stupid. Okay, maybe it is. There's, there's not a lot of payout for that, either personally or financially. But the kid's not lazy. The kid has just been everything that he has reasons to be passionate about have been stripped away from him, except for this video game system, which the culture says, here, go down to your basement, lock yourself away, and get out of our sight. So I would start addressing the cultural and sociological You'd take issues. the video game away? No, I would not do that at all. That's not, that's 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 just a symptom. I, I, but I, I, what I wouldn't do is say, "Hey, turn that off and get out in the yard and play," or "Hey, why don't you get a job?" I wouldn't do that. I would say, "You should get a job because you were created by God to love and serve people." And there are businesses, there's restaurants, there's people with grass growing in their yard who would be turned on by you coming and loving and serving them and you would be fulfilled. Now it's that, that, you know, I said that in probably 10 seconds, it's not going to turn the, it's going to have to be just a little more complicated them. than that. But, and not just complicated, but time consuming for them to get reprogrammed that you, living for others actually is rewarding. I would also say like, I'm going to borrow language from the 1950s, but, but I mean it like be a man. Like start what does that making, mean? Start making decisions. Your kid start looks at you and things. you say, be a man. And he's thinking, what does that mean? Yeah, well, I have to train him. I have to say, start making decisions. Be strong. Be aggressive. Take the initiative. Here's one thing I know, like being at college and being at high school, and I would tell my son this, girls do not like guys 
who sit there with their head down moping and saying, I don't care whatever you guys want to do. You girls, you just choose. They don't like that. They also don't like guys who are bullies, who leer at them, who sexually objectify them. But what they do like is a guy who is genuinely interested in them and has the guts to come up and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, what'd you do this summer? Or do you like, do you like volleyball? Do you, do you go to the volleyball games? I'm going to go. You want to hang out? And no, I'm not even talking about romantic. Like, I'm not talking about romance and finding a Just mate socialization. Here. I'm just saying girls like guys who make decisions. I'm not saying even make decisions lead. for them. Not, I'm not even saying lead them, but just to have ideas and are aggressive and say, hey, you need help with that homework? I was struggling with that too. I talked to the teacher. I can tell you. After class, I'll tell you what's going on with that problem. Like a guy who says, I I'll take initiative here. But guys have been beaten down and told, like, be meek, be mild, be quiet. Don't make eye contact with the girls. Don't make eye contact with anybody else. You can play sports if you want, but if you take that aggressive attitude off the court, you're going to get sent to the principal's office. They've been told that, and so they're kind of sitting there beaten. Nobody likes that. The other guys don't like it. The other girls don't like it. Like, be who you are and be aggressive and be a man. Make decisions. Serve other people. Like, talk to people. Make eye contact. People like it when we do this. And it actually, it's the cure to like the isolation that causes depression. Whatever those things are, and I'm sure it varies from parent to parent and from son to son, whatever those things are that fit into the category of be a man, the culture is like uh, targeting those things, looking for them on alert so that when they see them, they wag the finger at the at the boy or maybe even the, the man. Uh-uh-uh-uh. Nah, no. And they call that toxic masculinity. Be a man. Be masculine. Nope. That's poison. So that's not just an influence. That's a shot to the jaw is what that is. Um, when you think of the word or the phrase toxic masculinity, what does that mean to you? And do you have a rebuttal for that charge? Uh, yeah, let me answer that. I, I need to jump back here real quick and say one more thing. Uh, I said the phrase, be a man. I would rephrase that. I would say, you are free to be a man. The kids, all my, my son's already a man. He doesn't have to try and be something he's not. He's already a man. But just the way that God designed you to be, let it out. You can. You are free to be a man. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't be a man. That's what I would say. So just if I could go back and correct that phraseology okay. real quick here, because it, it, it's, it's quite condescending to say to him, be a man. It implies that he's not, and he needs to change who he is, and that would be very, very damaging. So uh, I hope nobody stopped listening to the episode right after I said that and thought, okay, I'm going to go tell my son that right now. That would not be smart. It's a nuance. Uh, yeah. Uh, toxic masculinity. It means a couple of things to me. Uh, one is, is it's a vibe. It's a vibe that says men are bad and need to be marginalized and the world would be better if they weren't involved with it. That's, that's a vibe part. That's the bad part. Well, they're both bad actually. That's the, that, that's the less true part. Toxic masculinity also means men addicted to porn. They see women as objects for their use. It could be their mom whose job is to give them a ride, give them money, bail them out when they get in trouble. Or it could be all you know the girls at their workplace, the women at their uh, in their office, or the girls in their school who are there mainly as either you're hot, I would have sex with you, or you're not, I don't want anything to do with you. The, the, the sexual objectification of women, that toxic man, that is masculinity. That's toxic. It's 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 not right with God. It's not the way men were designed to be. He did not create us to be animals. He created us in his image, which means he created us male and female for a relationship. We are to love and respect women um, as fellow image bearers of God. And if somebody says toxic masculinity, it's important to find out what do you mean? Because the first, the, the first one, the vibe, I'm not with you on that. The second one, yeah, let's work together. On, on, on nailing that to the wall. Like men have to be called on this and it's not going away anytime soon. The proliferation of porn means that young men who are already biologically programmed to be sexually hyper anyway, has, have now been given permission to release that sexuality in the pursuit of self gratification instead of 
harnessing that sexuality as a way to love and serve their spouse, to love and serve their spouse, not to gratify themselves, but to love and serve their spouse. And uh, yeah, to the extent that toxic masculinity is that part of it, it's I'm with I'm with the feminist 100. I am with the Me Too movement 100. To the extent that toxic toxic masculinity is a code word for let's take men out of public life, we would be better off. Then I'm 100 percent against it. So here are four texts from the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. First Corinthians 11. Paul says, "For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God." But woman is the glory of man. Ephesians 5, 3 verses, 22 through 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And finally, and I could do more, but four is probably enough. First Timothy 2 again, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. I think there are some women who might think that Paul was guilty of toxic masculinity. What do you think? Yeah, so uh, just a couple, a translation point real quick here, but I think it makes a difference. First Timothy 2, 11 and 12, the verses you quoted there at the end, um, Woman is probably not the best translation there. That word is also just as able to be translated wife. And it probably reads, let a wife learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a wife to teach or to exercise authority over a husband, whether she is to remain quiet. In the context, I believe that Paul is saying a wife should not publicly correct her husband or talk down to her husband. I think he'd probably say the same thing for husbands not publicly talking down or correcting their wives. But here in this context, a wife is not permitted to exercise that sort of authority over her husband. This goes along right along with what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. And he quart, quoted the section about wives submitting to their own husbands. Yeah, if you just look at just that, it could sound toxic because it could be toxic. You know, if a man is telling his wife, you submit to me, I do what I want. You're here for me. That's very, very toxic. But if he reads starting with verse 25 and following, which I know we've talked about on this podcast before, Chuck, where the husband's job is to be like Jesus in giving himself up to provide and self-sacrificially love his wife, then what you have is you have a wife who's submitting to her husband as the head and leader. You have a husband who is submitting. Paul uses the word submit back in verse 21 for both, both husband and wife. But he's doing it not in a way, he's doing it in the way that Jesus submitted, not because he's lesser than us or because he's not the head, but because he is the Lord exactly when he gives himself up to service. And so the husband's job is to, and this is not toxic at all, the husband's job is to lead his wife by making decisions that benefit her and not him, by always putting her first, by never using her, but by allowing himself to be a servant to her to make her better, to draw her closer to Christ, to make her life better, to make her, actually Paul talks in a couple of verses after this, to make her beautiful, to present her spotless. And um, that's not toxic at all. Paul's actually, you know, if you start off with current day gender roles are the law, the cultural law, then sure, everything Paul says is basically toxic. But if you start off with men and women are made to function in different ways in relationship with each other, not ways that are better or worse, not ways that have more power or less power, but in ways that are mutually loving and self-sacrificially submissive to each other in the name of Jesus, then Paul's not being toxic at all. He's just calling us back to relationship patterns that will actually make us happy and fulfilled in our relationships. So let's close our program by kind of going back to the original opening where I asked several questions. The most important of which I said, is there anything we can do to reverse this trend and help those who are suffering because masculinity is under attack in our culture and it's hurting, it's hurting men and women, but it's particularly hurting men. Do we just wait it out or is there something, can we activate and do something to change the direction of this? Yeah. So 
culturally, I, I'm not a big believer in individuals like changing the culture. I think it has to be a lot of individuals doing what they can do in the small arena that God has given them. In that light, if you have a son or a grandson who won't get out of the basement, I'd say for first step is to have the talk with him that we talked about earlier. But probably the main thing is if you're a father or a grandfather is to you act like you are free to be a man. Start treating your wife with respect. Start treating your wife as though God gave her to you to love and to serve. Start taking initiative. Start making decisions. Start leading your family for their own benefit. Like be aggressive, but in a way that that aggression is harnessed towards the service of others. That will set a model for it. But too often, young boys, you know, their fathers are saying, why don't you get a job? Why don't you get out in the yard and play some football? But what their fathers do is they act self-serving. They act like their jobs are miserable. They hate their customers and their clients. They hate their coworkers. They're bored with their wife. What, what, why should the kid come out of the basement to live that kind of life? I'd stay in the basement too if that was on offer to me. So start acting like a Christian man. And we can say wives and uh, ladies start acting like Christian women, and then we can provide a framework, a cultural and sociological framework that trains our kids to actually be real legitimate human beings. You've been listening to Craving Answers, Craving God. We can be found on a host of different platforms, so please email any thoughts, questions, or comments to CACG at stjamesglencarbon.org. We're grateful for the positive response that we hear and read from you. For Pastor Aaron Miller and Production Manager Larry O'Leary, I'm Chuck Rathard.